oftentimes we're told, well, you know, we don't really know what schizophrenia is or what exactly is going on in the, in the brain with this illness, but there actually is quite a bit that we do know based off extensive research analyzing the different factors that contribute to this disorder. About a year ago, a comprehensive review was written of what we do know about the science behind schizophrenia titled Neurobiology of Schizophrenia, a Comprehensive Review. Now we will link to this open access study in the description below, but honestly, I had to have a dictionary tab open to make my way through understanding everything in it. And so in this video, I'm going to try to communicate more accessibly and in a digestible way the ideas and findings presented in the paper. Now, before I get into all of that, I just want to quickly remind you all about our online peer support communities. They're a really wonderful way to connect with other people, your peers, who are going through similar things as you, and to just kind of have a level of understanding from people who may be experiencing similar challenges or difficulties or just experiences pertaining to mental illness. So we have one specifically for schizophrenia spectrum illnesses, which you can find out more at schizophreniapeersupport.com. And then we also have a more general, broad mental health peer support community, which you can find out more about at onlinepeersupport.com. Now we will have links to both of those in the description below, as well as in a pinned comment if you want to check out either of those or sign up today. So Schizophrenia forms as a result of multiple genes, biological processes, and environmental factors. The review starts off by discussing genetics as a factor in schizophrenia. They identify that the genes involved in the presentation of schizophrenia can actually be risk variants for other mental illnesses as well, such as bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and an autism spectrum disorder. Next, they talk about endophenotypes. Now, what they're talking about here is, for example, in the case of schizophrenia, the overt symptom could be psychosis, but the underlying phenotypes are, for example, a lack of sensory gating and a decline in working memory. Both of these traits have a clear genetic component and are called endophenotypes. Basically, they are measurable biomarkers of heritable illness in the population, and they are used to connect behavioral symptoms with specific traits and risk genes. There is a huge amount of involvement of the central nervous system in schizophrenia, particularly frontal lobe changes which are responsible for memory and executive functions, as well as temporal lobe changes which are responsible for things like language comprehension, auditory perception, and memory. There are many different genes that can contribute to these neurological changes in schizophrenia. I won't list them all out because I certainly don't know what exactly they are, but if you're curious, here is a list of potential genes that studies have found an association with. These genes are associated with the regulation of dopamine, contributing to the underlying cause of schizophrenia. Next, the review looks at pathophysiology, which is kind of a fancy way of saying the way the body functions relating to a certain illness. In this case, we're talking about schizophrenia. Neurotransmitters are chemical signals that pass from neurons to various cells, and some examples of these include dopamine, serotonin, GABA, endorphins, etc. There are many different neurotransmitters that have been associated with the positive, negative, and cognitive symptoms of schizophrenia, but dopamine dysfunction seems to be kind of the key factor in psychotic symptoms. Medical scans have shown that increased dopamine content is concentrated in the striatum. In patients with schizophrenia, changes in dopamine within the striatum causes delusions and psychosis. The striatum is also involved in the primary circuit responsible for psychotic symptoms, which also includes the thalamus and cerebral cortex. There are other pathways and parts of the brain that are also involved directly or indirectly with this circuit, such as the amygdala and hippocampus, which are responsible for perception and emotion regulation. Dysfunction of the thalamus and cerebral cortex can cause hallucinations and delusional symptoms. Next, the review goes on to discuss neuroanatomical changes, which is kind of a fancy way of saying changes in the structure and function of the nervous system. There are various regions of the brain that are implicated in patients with schizophrenia. Particularly though, the gray matter of the brain is consistently affected in schizophrenia. Gray matter is a type of tissue in your brain and spinal cord or your nervous system that plays a crucial role in allowing you to function normally day to day. MRI data has shown evidence of reduced gray matter volumes in the prefrontal, medial, and superior temporal lobes of the brain in patients with schizophrenia. This can explain things like memory decline and fluctuations in decision making that people living with schizophrenia often struggle with, myself included. As schizophrenia becomes chronic, the white matter of the brain gets affected as well. White matter is the axons that allow the exchange of information and communication between different areas of your brain. Some studies show that this change may perhaps be more related to the effects of using antipsychotics to treat schizophrenia, and so it does need to be looked into more closely. Significant changes in gray matter, though, are known to be a result of schizophrenia. Changes or abnormalities to parts of the brain with schizophrenia extend to other brain components as well. 
CT imaging has shown general brain tissue loss as well as ventricular enlargement in patients with schizophrenia. Changes that are associated with negative symptoms are also related to volume loss in the superior temporal lobe, medial temporal lobe, and thalamus. Changes that are associated with executive function difficulty has been related to structural abnormalities in the striatum, thalamus, cerebellum, anterior cingulate gyrus, hippocampus, medial temporal lobe, medial frontal, and posterior parietal cortex. If you don't know exactly what all of those parts of the brain are, it's okay, me neither. But basically, it's important to understand that brain dysfunction in patients with schizophrenia is due to a range of different brain networks rather than a single brain region. The review goes on to talk about neuropsychology, which is basically just how the brain affects cognition and behavior. They state that negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms, or cognitive dysfunction, are the primary reason for functional disability. And as someone living with schizoaffective disorder, I can fairly confidently attest to that as well. When testing cognitive functioning in patients living with schizophrenia, they found that there was clearly a level of impairment with things like memory, learning, executive functions, attention, processing speed, and general intellectual disability when compared to individuals who don't have schizophrenia. Some theories claim that these symptoms or dysfunctions are due to impairment in connectivity between cortices, the cerebral cortex or the outer layer of the cerebrum, which is essentially gray matter and plays an important role in consciousness, and neurotransmitter inputs. Executive functioning is something that I'm asked to explain a lot, and it's basically talking about the process where different areas of the brain function together to accomplish goal-directed behavior. One of the studies the review looked at concluded that patients with schizophrenia had more difficulties with things like conceptualization, planning, cognitive flexibility, verbal fluency, and the ability to solve complex problems, all of which, of course, are symptoms of poor executive functioning and stem from prefrontal cortex dysfunction. Another study they looked at showed that patients with schizophrenia experienced things like reality distortion, disorganization, and psychomotor poverty, which they connected with the work and social impairment people living with schizophrenia often struggle with as well. Hearing all of this felt validating in a way to know that it's literally the way my brain is functioning as a result of my schizophrenia that leads to my struggling with these types of things. I think it's easy to feel that it's just a personal failure, and perhaps that's what others sometimes chalk it up to as well. But there is concrete science behind why these types of things are more difficult for someone living with schizophrenia. In terms of positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia, the neuropsychology behind it is quite complex. But basically, the prefrontal cortex, basal ganglia, and the hippocampus are major brain regions involved in these positive and negative symptoms. So that is a not-so-brief, brief overview of the science of schizophrenia. I would definitely encourage you to check out the review I referenced throughout this video and the studies they draw from if you're interested in learning more. Of course, it is also still true that there is so much that we still don't know about schizophrenia and our understanding of what exactly is happening in the brain is only going to continue to deepen with further research. If there's anything I talked about in this video that you would like a deeper dive into, let me know in the comments below. And just a quick reminder about our online peer support communities, which you can find out more about and sign up for at the links in the description below or in the pinned comment. Also, if you're interested in just supporting us and continuing to create educational content like this, please consider becoming a monthly donor through our Patreon page, which the link to is also in the description below. We could not be doing this without our patrons, so thank you very, very much to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, wishing you and your loved ones good health. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.